Yes, it's fine, Rachel. Yes, it's fine. Thank you. That always goes wrong. Okay, thank you so much um, for inviting me to give a talk at this brilliant conference. Uh, it's been so nice to hear about everyone's research. I've got massive projects in envy. Um, I kept my title quite broad, <laughs> mostly so I would be able to focus it when it came to the time. Uh, but I've done that rookie mistake of shooting myself in the foot by trying to talk about it too much. So I'm going to get a move on. Um, I've called it Haysborough Plus, and you'll see why. So I think we just hide this from the screen. Okay, so this talk's going to be a kind of of two parts that I will hopefully link quite nicely. We'll see. Um, and there are a few areas that I'm going to I'm going to talk about. So when I say talk about, I'm going to mention because I'm aware that Louise is after me. Two places called Area Two Forty and Backton, and how they relate to these two places down the bottom here, Clacton and Area Four Four Seven. That's going to be the second half of my talk. But for the first part, um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the archaeology, particularly the offshore archaeology at Haysborough. Haysborough is on the coast of North Norfolk up here. And as you can see from these images, um, it's a really rapidly eroding coastline. It's probably due to this erosion that we have been able to discover. We have discovered um, several really significant archaeological sites in the intertidal zone on the foreshore in that area. Um, and when these sites were, were occupied, when people were here, Haysborough sat near the coastal zone of the Southern North Sea when it was this kind of shallow marine embayment. So basically throughout the entire time of this occupation at Haysborough, you could walk from Britain to the continent. So we had terrestrial landscapes in this area down here. And the sites at Haysborough are all held within the Cromer Forest bed formation, incredibly organic rich formation, tons of paleoenvironmental environmental remains um, telling us a lot about the environment and how they changed through time. And the time period is the early to early middle Pleistocene. So it's basically back from the Anglian glaciation, so back from half a million years or so. Two main sites, the first is Hazel 1. Hazel 1 dates to about half a million years ago. Um, and about a kilometre just up the coastline to the northwest, you've got the site of Haysborough 3. This is that really uh, famous one, I suppose. It's the earliest occupation of Northern Europe. It's dated to just under a million years ago. And associated, associated with the site, we've also got that footprint, footprint layer, um, earliest footprints outside of Africa. So it's the earliest of lots of things. Um, but why that's really important is because really this is, this is a, a period hundreds of thousands of years before we thought we had people up at these latitudes. Um, when I say people, these are a, a species that's pre-homo sapiens, of course, we're not sure who. Um, and we know that they're associated with a really quite a harsh environment, it's quite cold, there would be snow cover in the winter. We know from the footprint that these weren't super mobile people, they were children, they would have been pregnant women, um, less mobile people. So what are they doing here and how are they surviving in these landscapes? Something that comes up quite a lot is, is, is it something to do with these estuarine kind of lower lying landscapes near this coastal zone that perhaps prompted the occupation or sustained it? Um, and so, so what I've been interested in is trying to get to some of these potentially preserved deposits offshore at Haysborough that have been hinted at for hundreds of years. So for those hundreds of years, um, people have been finding tons of faunal remains along this coastline. People have been studying uh, the deposits there as well. And these are fantastic for telling us about the animals that existed. Um, but in terms of spatial location, there's not a lot of information that comes along with the finds of bones that come up from the coastline. Um, so in terms of what we can do analysis wise, thinking about how they relate to deposits that we know about, it's really quite difficult. This all changed um, in about 2014 or so, when we met a group of amazing collectors. So this is Darren, this is Joe, and this is Tim. This is Nick Ashton, who's at the British Museum. Um, and so before this point, people had found bits and pieces of lithics, but mostly it was, it was animal bones. These guys were the first to start finding prolific stone tools along this coastline. Um, so this analysis, which went from 2014 to about 2017 or so, consisted of, of nearly 800 um, stone tools and nearly 300 formal remains. So you can see them laid out along here and they go further that way as well. Um, this was, this kind of changed everything, I suppose, because they were not only collecting everything, so there was no bias. They picked up all the rubbishy little bits of bone, kept them in their houses, kept all the flints for us, 
and they GPS pointed everything. So suddenly we had a database that we could analyze spatially. And so that was one of the things that I was interested in, in looking at to try to use a spatial analysis to see if we could pinpoint areas underwater where some of this material could be washing in from. Um, and so that's a brief analysis that I'm going to show you in a second. I'm not really going to go into a lot of detail because I have quite a lot to do. Um, this is just to orientate you. So this is a map of the area. So you've got the, the land here, and this is the sea in white, hopefully. Um, sediment transport goes along shore down to the southeast. Um, the main areas then are site three, the early site, that's up here. Site one, the half a million year site is in here, in this embayment where you get a lot of erosion. Um, but there's also an area down towards Eccles. So you can see this kind of sand tombolo, the buildup of sand, which is caused by these shore parallel breakwaters. So I'm going to turn your view horizontal now, just to confuse you. There we go. So we have the northwest up here and the southeast down here. So what we started looking at was the density and how that related to abrasion, using abrasion basically as a proxy for movement. And this showed a few things. So it showed that where we had foreshore deposits and we um, we knew, knew about them. We were finding very fresh stuff was eroding out of them. And then you find these more abraded tails moving down to the southeast in line with transport movement. Um, and we found that in site three, we found that near site one. But it was the other areas that started to come up that were interesting. So there's an area just further down from site one, which we couldn't really explain. Um, so we started to think about this area offshore here. There was a bit more that went along with it, sorry, that I'm, I'm not gonna go into huge amounts of detail about. Um, first area of high potential was offshore site one in this kind of embayment area where it looked like there was the likelihood there were deposits yielding archaeology. But the area that I'm really interested in as well is further to the south at Eccles North Lab. So you can see here this density plot of, this was about 70% of the lithics that were found were all found here. And they were backing up against the sand that formed against this, I'm um, sure, parallel breakwater. This is really interesting because we don't know where it's coming from. There's nothing known south of site one. Nothing's been mapped along here. Nothing's known underwater historically or in the modern day. Um, maybe it's coming from site one and it's eroding down. Uh, but if it's doing that, you'd expect it to be really abraded it's no more abraded really than most of the stuff up here. Also, the sea defences are pretty good. Mobility is not as high as it is in other areas. And you'd expect to see, you know, a tail of these lithics moving their way down the shore if you don't see that. So it started to seem like, to me at least, this material was more likely to be eroding out deposits underwater, just offshore, eroding out, moving down in line with sediment transport, getting caught up in the system, coming onto the beach. So two key areas that we wanted to ground truth underwater, out here and out here. So we had a few weeks of underwater field work. Um, we had another week that was supposed to be last year, but obviously that's been postponed to this July. Um, but over those weeks, we were lucky enough to find several areas underwater with uh, in situ chromophorous bed deposits. So the first one we found is this site here, which is OA. You can see the laminations. This is full of organics, it's incredible. I'll show you a video in a second. This sits here. So kind of in line with those site one channels and about 800 meters offshore, relative close to shore. And one that was really close to shore here, which is site OC. Uh, this is a still, it's a terrible picture. I'll show you a video, but it's basically what you're looking at is undulating haze pratil and underlying that you have this concreted material and more laminations. But also a site called OB, further up to the north. This was totally by chance. People had just started finding a load of hand axes and stuff on the beaches here-ish. And Tim, one of our collectors, is a lifeboatman. And he's like, go and check out this drop-off we found. So we went out and we did quite quickly <laughs> find more deposits. They're everywhere. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video just to show you the differences between some of these. Hopefully this will play. Just learn how to do this. Some of them are terrible, I apologize. This is site OA. These are the laminations, and you can see this incredible conglomerate of peat. It's just full of organics, it's a bit of wood. This is a whole bit of wood. That's a 50 centimeter scale. It's huge. And these are the laminated deposits at OA. And in a second, you'll see my colleague, Crystal Asafadi, she's taking the core through the deposits. So we were taking these so that we could then take them and analyze them for pollen. This is the, the site closest to shore OC. So these are the till deposits, the undulating till that's being eroded. Underlying that Haysborough till, 
you see this concreted deposit. This is really interesting because we're finding it washing up on beaches associated with lithics as well as um, the bones of animals. So really key to understanding this relationship and the relationship of that with those finds coming from this area. You also find this worm matting growing over the hard substrate in this area. So it's a bit of a um, an indicator. And this is a terrible video, I apologize. I had about five things in my hands and I was never meant to show anyone, but just to, to give you an indication of what it's like. This area, far less organic. So this is the furthest up, this is site OB, um, the kind of fortuitous one. And in that location, we're, it's a much more kind of sterile-like deposit. It's not sterile, but there's not much in it. Um, so you can see this is a call that we took through that furthest away site, so the last one in the video. It's got this big sand layer here. This is the wood, the, the OA. This is the really organic site full of the wood. About five metres from this, um, typically like right before we had a week where we couldn't see our hands in front of our faces, we found this natural section, which was eroding out about five metres away, where these laminations pinch out, or at least are thinner, and they're overlying um, a higher energy deposit. So this is a, a mini core to the higher, en higher energy deposit. And we also took some bulk samples. As you'll see, there's no cores through the area of the till deposits. Because of that concreted layer, it's really hard to get anything through. We went back to do more work, but the visibility was shocking. So that's one for the future. Um, but we've done some analysis on these. So there's been um, pollen, forams, mollusks, um, getting some really interesting results. So the sites with all the organics, OA, the one that's 800 metres or so out, looking relatively similar to, to what we're used to thinking about for haze rose which is that we have this kind of edge of an estuarine zone. So it's low salinity, um, kind of brackishy uh, evidence going on. Um, so similar to site three in that sense, but warmer, there's no long frosts. Um, so we have a Zola, which is duckweed, which is indicating the no long frost element. Um, and the pollen indication that we've got deciduous trees, there's also some coniferous component. Um, in terms of chronology, despite this site being in line with those, those site one deposits, nothing like it in terms of stratigraphy. And it's also looking like it's more chronologically in line with maybe site three. So it's looking more towards the million year mark for, for OA. The image I showed you a second ago, that section where you had the higher energy deposits underlying the laminations where we're taking samples for this, we found a Voltooth, which looks um, tiny and ridiculous, but are actually like finding gold. <laughs> so <laughs> a tiny bulk sample and we found one of these. And this is now with um, a variety of, of foal experts. They're great for chronology. So this is looking like it's it's pointed to about 1.2 million years ago for the underlying deposit. So sitting again quite nicely in with what we're thinking about from the pollen for site OA. And for OB, the, the furthest up site, the kind of more sterile looking site, this is looking more like it's shallow marine. So the particle size distribution um, and some of the other lines of evidence are it's pointing to kind of sublittoral zones. So very unlikely to be related to the archaeology, the, the terrestrial archaeology that's been washed up on speeches. Um, but it's preservation and the fact that it's the paleoenvironmental evidence is indicating that this is if this is younger than OA um, means I think there's definitely potential to go back and, and look at the, the wider extent of it to see if we can find those deposits that are potentially associated where the finds are coming from. So obviously there's quite a lot of work to be done here, but it's really starting to highlight the complexities in a lot of these, these offshore deposits and starting to give us an indication um, of the areas that we're that we're working with. So we have a fairly good-ish understanding of these three areas then, um, and definite need to go back to the, the closest issue area because I think there's a ton of a ton of stuff going on in terms of the concretions. We've also found some ex situ lithics here as well, so a good place to go back to for, for finding the source of that archaeology. But when I started, I talked about this area down here. And I'm still really interested in this area, but we have found nothing. So we dived there constantly and all we found is, is sand waves um, and a, a very boring modern looking seabed. So um, the idea was to go out and look at what's under the sand waves. So you've seen tons of seismics over the past few days. Um, and I apologize mostly to Richard Bates who helped me to collect this data without whom none of this would have happened at all. Um, 
because I, I still haven't worked them up in a very professional manner, so I apologize for that. But these are our lines. We were in a rib and it was quite choppy. Um, and when you look at what's coming out of those, so I appreciate these are just lines on a map, um, what we're seeing in the data is, is really quite interesting. So previously, we haven't found anything coming up in data offshore Haysburg, but what we used this time was the NMR parametric system, so the compact system. So we're getting high resolution in the top five meters or so. And it's really bringing out some interesting stuff. So we've got channel systems coming out. This is kind of Ostend way. So this is where we're finding that kind of sterile, shallow marine area up here. More channel systems coming out here, quite complex looking off site three as well, moving offshore. Towards Haysborough site one, um, much more complexity. So systems that look like they are in line with what's going on on the foreshore that's being excavated, but further to the southeast, a lot more going on. So much more complexities um, with these channel systems. And this ties directly in with the work that Martin and Richard Bates did with the onshore geophysics as well. So I think there's a lot more to do to unpicking those complexities in future. But the key thing that I was really excited about is these little lines in here. And these little lines represent paleochannels and associated deposits, which are coming out in this area that I'm really interested in. So I've nicely cropped it off here, but the archeology span is basically backing up in sand about here. So the fact that we're finding this is really interesting. These are some really basic images that I've like, cut out of some of the lines to show you what some of these things look like. Um, like so obviously we, they're getting towards the Southeast from their association with the till, it seems like they're, they're associated with the Chroma forest bed, but there's always a question because we have Holocene deposits a little bit further south. So we do need to find out exactly what they are. But they're very interesting when you think about the fact there are several of them and you start to think about the, the exposure, the erosion and the burial of the seabed in that area. Because what we find is that when we found those lithics, they were there for about five years, they were washing up, about five years, four years. Um, before that, oh, and they were associated with a fauna that was um, temperate but not super warm. Before that, there was a gap, and before that, there was a faunal signature that was fully interglacial. It was like Pakefield, it was like Mediterranean style, um, lovely warm weather fauna, faunal remains. So you clearly got different aged deposits underwater associated with different areas different levels or different patterns of exposure, erosion and burial, bringing them onto the foreshore. So I think there's a ton of work to be done in terms of looking at those movement patterns. And these are things that we're, we're seeing anyway. So we see this rapid movement happening. This is an area that we dug in 2015. You can see the exposure, it's fully scoured out. We return to the site um, a few years later and what you find is huge sand waves. So you see, and I mean, that's, that's two years, so it's not, it's not a small period of time, but giant, giant sand waves covering this area and also amazing visibility, this is very unusual. Um, and it's also what we see on the beach. So you can walk one day on sand and the next week it will look very, very different. So I think there's something here to think about in terms of understanding these patterns of movement of sand waves and how they're affecting the deposits. So I'm really interested in attempting to map the movement of these and how it's affecting the archaeology of the deposits and how it's tying in with the finds that we're seeing, but not just in, on the foreshore, also thinking about foreshore and how that differs to surf zone and how that differs to somewhere deeper off as well. So I think there's some really interesting things here and sorry, really interesting work to be done in the future because unpicking that I think will be the key to understanding the patterning we're seeing in the archaeology on shore. Um, it also kind of links in with some of our finds, these ideas. I realised I didn't show you any pictures of finds. Um, this is the lovely one. It's not any of our flints, but this is a mammoth ulna. And this was found um, where I, that previous video, where we shot that, approximately that location. But it was found by two different divers on two different days, and it refits perfectly to fit one mammoth ulna. Clearly, it's been exposed for a while. It's rounded. It's covered in bryozoa. Um, but it's clearly moving in a very predictable fashion. And that predictability, again, kind of ties in with these ideas that if we can start to understand that movement and that predictability, then perhaps we've got a better chance of locating where this archaeology is coming from. So the work at Haysborough then is helping us to move from a known area onshore to its kind of offshore correlates, if you like, not direct correlates, but the areas offshore that kind of relate to some of these deposits which is brilliant and I love it and I think it's incredibly valuable. 
But I'm always left with this question about what we're doing further offshore. I need to start talking quickly because I think about 20 minutes. Um, what we're doing further away, right? So we're right on the coastline, but we're interested in this massive area. How are we getting to that? We have all this mapping, and you've seen over the few, past few days, this is doing incredible things for, you know, maybe the, the post-LGM period. But really, when we move further back in time, it's not helped us move the archaeology further in any massive way. So what is helping us then? Because I did say that I would be taking a positive note to this talk. Um, so over the past six years or so, we have found, been working with people who have found two incredible assemblages of Middle Paleolithic finds. You can see them laid out here. So Middle Paleolithic, this is date. These are some, probably somewhere around three to 200,000 and they're Lafolwa associated with Neanderthals. And where are these coming from? These are coming from aggregate extraction. Okay, so where we're seeing the aggregate, we're starting to see quite a lot of archaeology. The obvious place to start here is Area 240. So again, really, really briefly, sorry, Louise. Um, but we know Area 240 came from total chance. So, you know, it was brought to a wharf where they don't crush that size material immediately and found by a man who was off sick, so he was looking. Because he found it, Area 240 existed um, because Area 240 is known about, the surrounding areas can be looked at, which is brilliant, but it has implications for everywhere else, because essentially if, if we don't find the archaeology, we can't then get access to look for more, but then we can't find it. So it's this frustratingly circular problem. But where we do see the archaeology from the aggregates is when it's on a beach replenishment scheme. And we know from Holland, on the, the, the coast of the Netherlands, that this is happening all the time. They're finding tons of middle Paleolithic and other areas or other time periods archaeology along their coastline. Um, and in Britain, it started happening too. So up at Bacton two years ago, material was taken from somewhere close to 240. Um, and as soon as it was deposited, collectors were finding hundreds of, of middle Paleolithic Lavalwa implements. Um, this is work that's ongoing with the the British Museum, Queen Mary of London, and also Wessex archaeology. So we're not going to go into any more detail, but I'm just going to quickly finish by talking about a very similar site associated with Area 447 and a beach replenishment at Clacton. This took place from 2014 to 2015. And as with Bacton, when it was put on the beach, immediately people started to find tons of material. Um, so you can see some of the Laval implements laid out here. Becky Scott is like a kid in a sweet shop. These are our collectors, two of them, Paul and John and local archaeologists, Adam. Um, so an incredible assemblage. So when this was found, this is smaller in terms of size than Bacton, uh, but when it was found, it was one of, it was the biggest modern Laval assemblage found. And I think the third biggest if you include all of the historical collections. So it's really significant. Um, so we started working with the collectors and with the agri industries in Historic England to try to backtrack to where these were coming from. We were able to look at things like dredge plots, um, all the geophysics, as well as being able to select some higher potential cores that were taken at the beginning of 2015 to try to do some analysis and to try to take some OSL dates. These cores have been split. Um, wrapped in cling film and left in a warehouse since 2015. So they haven't been left in a core store, you know, these were just used for, for industry, basically. So it was uncertain to the, the degree to which this would be successful. We had results back quite recently and they were amazing. So um, if Michael's here, he can probably talk to us better than I can, but, and I should have said, sorry, this, this is a project that's with uh, Michael Grant and Justin Dix, both at the University of Southampton. Um, the pollen, the mollusks, everything is indicating what to me sounds like a, a lovely place to live. So it, again, similar to Haysborough, we're talking about kind of local brackish, salt marsh, coastal sandy dunes, slow moving water, grasslands and woodland. All of this pointing to a similarity with other sites which are dated to the end of MIS-7. Hi Jeff, sorry, I'm finishing. <laughs> um, and the post, the, you know, the pollen, looking like it's a post av pollen assemblage, so late MIS-7 coming into six. The OSL dates we just got back agree completely with that. This is amazing, those calls were just left in warehouse for ages. Um, the key thing about the OSL dates here is you can see stratigraphically, they're working really nicely. These are paired mineral luminescence dates. So rather than simply using the quartz mineral on its own, this uses your potassium feldspar and your quartz and looks for the agreement between the two. And this has really good agreement between the two. Um, so a resounding success for these 
calls from a warehouse, which are giving us this amazing insight into a really important period of time. So this is the, the period when Yantel's leaving Britain for the abandonment in MI6 all the way through to 65,000. So understanding what's going on with these Neanderthals at that time, linking it in with the Dutch evidence, linking it in typologically with the continent, can tell us huge amounts about a period we really know very little about. It's also significant because the recent reassessment of the area 240 dates by Peter Marshall in 2020 placed that site as well in this period. Visually speaking, the back to material fits also. So we have two, possibly three, sites in this area where the biggest amount of archaeology we've got is all coming from the submerged Southern North Sea. And I think that's incredibly significant. And um, Jeff will be pleased I'm concluding now. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, the first thing I wanted to say in terms of concluding thoughts was just to say all of this work is, is thank you, was thanks to uh, collectives, volunteers who are doing all of the hard work here and sometimes stinking out their house with buckets full of like sea, sea bones, you know. Um, all of it's thanks to them. Um, and so on that vein, this ex situ out of context archaeology can tell us so much, both in terms of things like the onshore offshore connections that we're seeing at Haysborough, but also about these areas further offshore, because where we're getting access to aggregates that's being taken from further offshore from these higher potential areas, like so east coast and towards the south, we are starting to see these pretty big significant assemblages. And the demonstrated value of these split calls for dating and for paleo environmental use is incredible. Um, and so whilst this backtracking is not ideal um, at the moment, you know, it's, work, it's working pretty well, but ultimately what we want to be doing is, is working more, I think, um, and I'm, I'm sure other people work in several degree with industry to try to think creatively about how, how we work with these deposits before they're disturbed. Because I think if we can do that and we can situate the archaeology more clearly when it is found, then that has really great potential for, for understanding the record offshore. And thank you. We've done record time. Uh, thank you um, very much, Rachel. Um, uh, you did start up because of me a little late, so Good. Give you a few minutes. Um, uh, really interesting stuff and great to see um, you pursuing that relationship between material turning up in the intertidal zone and in situ material further offshore, and also showing that not all underwater work has to be high tech. No. You're diving there with nothing more complicated than a scuba tank, a hammer and a metal tube. And, and plumbing, uh, plumbing pipe. <laughs> so um, that's great. Now, do we have any questions? I think we've got time for the two that have shown up here. Uh, Tabitha Kabora is saying, um, do you find evidence of these sand wave deposits in your cores or in the bathymetry and how do they affect your archaeological interpretations? Yes, yeah, so um, in the bathymetry, yes, because it's it's modern, it's, they're, they're modern. So essentially these, these sand waves are a modern artifact of the seabed, modern part of the seabed. Um, we don't find them in our cores because the cores are, they're not because we're taking the cores as divers, we're taking them directly through Pleistocene deposits. If we were sticking fibre cores down, then presumably, you know, yes, you might you'd pick up a modern seabed, but because we're not doing that, we're going straight into the Pleistocene. And because the Pleistocene deposits are terrestrial, we don't have evidence of, of, of those things because they're modern, modern sand waves. Um, and how it's affecting the archaeology, I think, is one of the questions I'm really interested in. So how how does the archaeology, how is it affected by the sand waves in terms of erosion, but also in terms of movement? That's something that's always interested me. So no answers really, sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, and from Trevor Faulkner, um, I think we'd better make this the last one. Can you confirm absence of Neanderthal records from MIS-5E? No. You just can't. I mean, you know, you, you, <laughs> answer. I think, I think, you know, the, the, there's a lot of evidence from 5E and it's, it's paleo environmental. There's no evidence of archaeology, but all it would take is one site. And there has been evidence from that the Francis Wendon Smith worked on, I think it was 5D, so about 100,000. Um, I can't remember the name of the site, but there were like four flints that came up. So, you know, there may have been people that survived here, but it doesn't look like we've got any kind of big occupational signal. So we would have probably have seen it. So. Dartford. Dartford's the Thank you. Dartford. There we go. Yeah.